place for me. And then I'll get to uh, literature and reading and all that stuff. So let me talk about the new stuff first. And I'm going to call this path theory, the theory of paths. And we're all on a different path. And that's good for the human race. Let me tell you about it. <clears throat> I discovered this with a quote from Mark Twain, who said, the two most important days of your life, the day you're born and the day you discover why. And the day you discover why for me means the day you discover what you're supposed to do in your life. Uh, Rumi, the Persian philosopher, said it very well. He said, "Someone, everyone has been made for some particular work and the desire for that work has been put in every heart and it's different for all of us. It took me a long, long time to figure out what I was supposed to be doing. I didn't find out till I was in my 20s, 23, 24. And after that, life made much more sense. Kurt Vonnegut said something very similar. Each person has something that he can do easily and can't imagine why everybody else is having so much trouble doing it. I found this, by the way, I'm repeating for you a talk I gave yesterday to my granddaughter. We had a long telephone conversation. She's 16 years old, 16 years old, and worried about what courses to take, what to do. And this is what I told her, exactly what I'm telling you. And she said it made a lot of sense. Um, I, I got this idea, a uh, part of it when I was a graduate, so when I was a beginning professor at UCLA. And one of my best friends in college was a guy named Larry Hyman, whose specialty was phonology, sound systems. My first job in, in California, he came with me and he was the new chairman of the department, which is wonderful when your best friend is the chairman. He did phonology, I did language acquisition. He would look at my work and say, Steve, how did you figure all that out? I can't imagine. When I looked at his work, which was in sound systems, phonological theory, I had the same reaction. I said, Larry, how did you find that out? We all have different talents and we all apply them in different ways. Once we are on our path, then we can start learning things. We can only learn when we're on our path. And the learning on our path is pleasant and efficient. It feels right. You, you like it. It feels that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. The feminist writer Gloria Steinem said it very well. She said, writing is the only thing when I do it, I don't feel I should be doing something else. Same thing with me when I'm doing work in language acquisition and reading and literacy. I feel that's what I should be doing. And you're good at it when you're on your path. It seems easy and natural to, to you. Um, you may not be good at anything else, but when you're on your path, you know you're doing the right thing. Uh, R.L. Stein said this, the author of children's horror books. There, I've read quite a few of them, they're very good. He said, all I can do is write these little books. I'm not good at anything else. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. Uh, Beethoven said the same thing. Dave, Beethoven said, all Beethoven can do is write music and that's all. And it's a good thing. The philosopher Chinsik Mahali pointed this out. The human race needs a diversity of talents and skills to survive. If we were all more or less alike, we would be narrowly specialized and it would be hard for us to adapt to changing conditions. So the human race needs all of us. When you're on your path and you're doing your stuff on your path, it's not work, it's pleasure. You can't get enough of it. Ralph Nader, the uh, environmental uh, uh, the conscience of the world with environment. He talked about his work. He was asked about his work schedule. Here's what he said. It's pretty much all the time, but I enjoy it so much. The definition of words of work tends to apply a drag, a chore, a chore, something you'd rather not be doing. I don't see it that way. It's a joy. That's how I feel. A book that my son uh, recommended that I read, it's, uh, the book is called Advice to a Young Mathematician. And in one chapter, Bella Bolaba says, research should never be a chore. You should choose problems you find difficult not to think about. That's me all day long. I have a hard time staying away from the work. 
It's something I want to do. I feel driven to work. Gore Vidal said, I'm reluctant to start work and reluctant to stop. Uh, the best chess player in the world for many years was a man named Bobby Fischer. And he was observed about to uh, get a, a medal and award for being the number one chess player in the, wor in the world. He was in the audience waiting for his turn to get his award. What was he doing? He was reading a book on chess problems. He was doing what he really loved to do, okay? Uh, there's a wonderful book that I highly recommend. It's by a woman named Charlotte Chandler and it's called The Ultimate Seduction. It's not about romance. It's not about sex. It's about finding your work. The Ultimate Seduction came from a quote from Pablo Picasso. He said, your work is the, the ultimate seduction. Now it takes a while to find your path. And this has helped me understand myself a little better. You go on false paths. I call them now prerequisite paths. I went on a number of them. It turned out they weren't the right one for me, but they all helped. They all gave me the knowledge I need to find my path. Um, I first heard about this when I was in the, I was in the Peace Corps in Ethiopia. I didn't want to go to the war in Vietnam. So I joined the Peace Corps and got a deferment and I was teaching in a school. I got very excited about learning the language, acquiring the language. The language was Amharic, uh, uh, Semitic language like Hebrew and like uh, uh, Arabic. I was one of the few people among the other teachers that got very involved in trying to acquire the language. I lived in a house with two other guys. This was 50 years ago. And one of them, Frank, I got along quite well with two of them. One of them, Frank, Frank and I were very different. It's amazing that we got along so well. And uh, I remember we were discussing what we were going to do after the Peace Corps. And I said, well, I really don't know. And Frank said, look, Steve, you like languages. That's what you like. You speak French quite well. You speak German quite well. And now you're one of the few volunteers, one of the few teachers who speaks Amharic. Your field is language. He told me that, he observed it. Uh, this was you know, 50 years ago. I wrote him last week and I thanked him for that remark. Uh, we weren't buddies, we weren't pals, but he really helped me understand what I wanted. I'll tell you how I found the path, the last moment. Uh, I had finished one year of college and I didn't know what to do. And my mom, very wise woman said, young man, I want you to go to Europe. You can go on a bicycle tour of Europe with other young people. Maybe you'll find what you want. I did it. It was a lot of fun. We bicycled down the Rhine Valley. And the last week of the trip, we were at a party at a youth hostel in Switzerland. And I spent the time at the youth hostel at the party watching another young man. He was speaking French to one group, German to another group, and speaking pretty good English to us. And then it hit me. I want to do that. I want to be able to do that. I want languages. The Peace Corps, I'm sorry, the uh, youth hostel bicycle trip was over. So the next day I was on a train to Paris, enrolling in a language school, getting better in French. I did a year in Vienna, uh, studying piano, music, but I realized later piano was okay. I got better at it, it was all right, but I had more fun getting good in German. That's what I really liked. So I found my path and my life since then has been very uncomplicated. School should be a place where you find your path. And that happened to me. Graduate school, my teachers helped me invited me into their work, uh, helped me do it. And I found other uh, students who I also worked with and they helped me along the path. You can only solve problems when you're on your path. This will make more sense when I give my major talk tonight and I should get into that while there's still time. Uh, I'm gonna talk about language acquisition and, and is still now, even today, I'm spending all my time on my paths and I'm gonna begin with that, with one anecdote. that will give you an idea of what my work has been like. I live about mm, 20 minutes from a big supermarket and the supermarket now has a time when you can shop 
early on Friday mornings, 6.30 in the morning, only for old people. We have to be at least 65. So I started going there early in the morning. The first time I was there, it was new people working there, the early morning shift. The guy who, the person who was taking my groceries and ringing them up in the cash register, I saw his name and it was Fidel. So I figured he speaks Spanish, he's from Mexico. So it turned out I was right. I started speaking Spanish to him. He answered me in English, oh no. And he said, I'm sorry, I have to do this, but that's the rule of the store. We have to speak English to all customers. I immediately switched to Spanish, okay? I didn't care. And here's what I said. I said, Fidel, tu puedes ayudarme, you can help me. Mi meta es hablar español como ustedes. I want to speak Spanish the way you do. Por favor, hablamos español. Let's speak Spanish. We spoke Spanish. Now, Spanish is not my best language. It's like number three, four, or five on the list. But I had such a good time. I loved it. I've been going to, to that store every Friday morning for the last year and a half. And I can meet Fidel. And we've been speaking Spanish. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, Monica, hablamos español. I'm with you. Anyway, and I'm getting better in Spanish, no question. Fidel is speaking to me more rapidly. He's using more complicated language. And I'm getting better, there's no question. Uh, we're not just doing hablar, we're what we're doing, charlar. We're gossiping a little bit. We talk about other people. We're having a good time. Who was it who said, um, the best thing to do if you want to really learn a language is learn how to talk about people. And it's the most interesting gossip. I'm getting better. I've run into friends that I don't see very often. I've spoken Spanish with them. They say, Steve, your Spanish is so much better. Why? What are you doing? I'll tell you the secret. The secret is not talking to Fidel. I only am with him for like five minutes once a week. And most of the time he's talking, I'm talking, he's talking. So I don't get a lot of input. I'll tell you what I'm doing that's really worked. I go home and I've been reading lots of very easy books in Spanish. I found a couple of authors, they're called graded readers, and I've been reading them every day. The graded readers have become literature. They're much, much better. That's why my Spanish has improved. Lots of easy reading and they're wonderful books. I'll give you an idea what they're like. Um, Adriana Ramirez is now my favorite author. She lives in Canada. She was born in Bogota. She writes these wonderful little stories. I'll tell you about one to get the idea. It's about this guy from California, just like me, and he's in Bogota. He doesn't speak Spanish hardly at all, and he gets lost. He's supposed to meet some friends at a hotel. He meets another young man who helps him out. Can you tell me where this donde esta el hotel, you know, in his broken Spanish? And they become good friends, and he takes them to the hotel. While they're walking to the hotel, two beautiful young ladies come rushing up to him. They give him hugs. They give him kisses on the cheek. They hold his hand. The, then the, uh, my friend, the helper, uh, in introduces me to the young ladies. They give me hugs. They hold my hand. Finally, we come to the hotel and my new friend, the guide, says, I suppose you're wondering what's happening here. He says, there's no, nothing going on. There's no romance. These girls are my cousins. And here in Bogota, we're very warm and we're very physical when we meet someone we know. We give each other hugs, we hold hands, this kind of thing. That's, so she kept the story very interesting. What's going on? She explained it. The whole book is possible misunderstandings and you get an idea of what the culture is. So I've been reading like books like this for the last year, and it's really, really helped. Let me now repeat everything in more technical terms, no more stories, at least not too many, and I'll give you the theory. The theory begins with some definitions, and some of you heard me talk about this last time. We have two ways of getting better in a language. We can acquire language, and we can learn language, and they're very different. Acquisition is the subconscious way, the natural way, picking up a language, okay? While it's happening, you don't know that it's happening, 
uh, you don't know that you're acquiring something new. We are very good at language acquisition. The brain does it very, very well. The other process is language learning. Language learning is conscious, knowing the rules, knowing the grammar, the subject and the verb are supposed to agree. The third person singular, you add S. This is language learning, the rules. When we are corrected, we think about the rule and we get a better rule, etc. The brain is not very good at language learning. We're much better at language acquisition. Let me illustrate this for you by giving you a quick language lesson, uh, a language that you may have heard before, and you can tell me which one is better. Language lesson number one. Wir werden jetzt anfangen, Deutsch zu lernen. Und ich möchte Ihnen voraus sagen, dass nach meiner Meinung Deutsch ist eine sehr schöne Sprache und ich hoffe, dass Sie alle sehr viel Erfolg mit Deutsch haben werden. What do you think? Good lesson so far? If I kept talking to you like that, you think you would pick up German? No. How about if I said it slower, would that help? No, not at all. Here's lesson number two. And you have to watch me on the screen. Das ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Verstehen Sie das? Kopf, ja. Und hier sind meine Ohren. Ohren. Ich habe zwei Ohren. Eins, zwei. Und hier sind meine Augen. Meine Augen. Ich habe zwei Augen. Eins, zwei. Und hier sind meine Zigaretten. Meine Zigaretten. Ach, ich habe keine Zigaretten. Zigaretten sind nicht gut. If you understood lesson number two, not every word, but more or less, I did everything necessary to teach you German. Now, let me explain to you how language acquisition really happens, and I'll share with you some amazing mystical thoughts about language acquisition. Language acquisition happens in only one way. When we understand what we read, or we understand what we hear. When we understand input, when we get comprehensible input, that's the only way it happens. That's it, no individual variation. Amazing facts about language acquisition. Amazing fact number one, effortless, no work. You, when you heard me do the German lesson, you got a little bit of German and you acquired a little bit. No work, no effort. It's natural and it's easy. Number two, even more amazing. Language acquisition is involuntary. Like it or not, if you understood a little of the second lesson, you acquired a little bit of German. No matter you liked it or not, that's how it happens. Uh, the Chomsky says, my hero, Noam Chomsky, he says that language acquisition, the language acquisition device is a mental organ. It works automatically. For example, if you have good eyes and your eyes are open and there's light, you see things. You can't turn off your visual system. You can't turn off your auditory system. If you're listening, you will hear the noise of the language around you. Same thing. Hear the same thing. If you get comprehensible input, you will acquire that's the way we are made. A corollary of this, talking is not practicing. If you want to get better in another language, you can get it by listening, not by talking. I remember when I was a beginning language te teacher, I gave practice lessons and the supervisor watched me and I told a story. I still think that was a good idea. And the supervisor said, oh no, no, you shouldn't be talking. The students should be talking wrong. I now know that I was doing the right thing. The ability to speak is the result of language acquisition, not the cause. In fact, if you try to talk too early, you're not really ready. It's very uncomfortable. I'll tell you how I discovered this. This was, oh gosh, about 50 years ago when my daughter was a little girl. She was like six, seven years old. And she would go visit a neighboring family who had a little girl her age. So my task that day was to go to her house, pick up my daughter and bring both girls to my house because the mom had to go somewhere, fine. So I got there and the mom said, well, I'm glad to see you, I've got to leave. She was going to her Spanish class 
at the local community college. She said, oh wait, before I leave, I've got to go take my medication. She took some water, took the pill, put it in her mouth, drank the water, says, okay, now I can go. Now we were quite good friends, neighbors. We knew each other for a long time. I said, what, what was that that you were taking? And uh, she said, well, I took Valium. Today it would be Prozac, anti-anxiety medication. I said, why are you taking Valium? What's going on? And uh, she said, it's Spanish class. It makes me so nervous. Actually, she didn't say that. She said, Spanish class freaks me out. It makes me very, very nervous. And I said to her, I asked her, I said, what is it about Spanish class that makes you nervous? Having to speak, being called on in class. That's the problem. I went home, I looked at all the research. She was absolutely right. The number one factor in making people nervous in beginning classes is what we call forced speech, having to speak before you've acquired the necessary language. Using consciously learned language is quite difficult and quite painful, and it doesn't help, okay? So now you know the secret. The secret is getting interesting, comprehensible input. We actually, I like more than interest, interesting. I like the word compelling, really interesting. So interesting you forget that you're listening to another language, okay? That's the crucial, I've given you the crucial part of the theory. Tell you a little more about it. We think language acquisition is gradual. It doesn't happen all at once. You get new vocabulary on Monday, you're supposed to load them, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. No, you get a little bit of time. You, you, the researchers at the University of Illinois did this wonderful work on first language. They concluded that each time you hear a new word or a new grammatical word, and a grammatical rule in context, you get a little bit of it. You get maybe 5% of it or less. Gradually, if you hear it more often in context, you gradually pick it up. Well, I want that is the theory. I want to talk about application right away. And I want to tell you another story about where I live and how I got this idea. I told you I live about 30 minutes from uh, Los Angeles, from the city. And for a long time, for many years, I was driving back and forth twice a week. I had good reason. Uh, my grandchildren uh, live in uh, Santa Monica, about half an hour away. So I, I'm co still completely addicted to my grandchildren. So I had to go see them. And I went to Venice Beach, Muscle Beach, where I would go pump iron, lift weights, which was just wonderful. Um, it was great because I met the same people there every you know, once or twice a week. We would work out together, do our bench presses and our curls. And you know who would come every so often? Arnold. Arnold would show up. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the world's best bodybuilder, no question. Um, Arnold at the time was in his 20s, and he was already Mr. America twice, okay? Uh, he really knew his stuff. He would come out. He was very friendly. I have to tell you this. Arnold was very friendly. You'd be doing your bench presses, and Arnold would come over and say, oh, try it this way, you know? Okay. So after our workout, we would get together, and we would tell each other what Arnold told us. So we got a graduate course in weightlifting, which was wonderful, okay? So I would go back and forth uh, twice a week, two hours in the car. What do you do in the car and you're driving? Well, there are three possibilities. One possibility is listen to the news on the radio. I can't do that. I can't, because it's all Donald Trump. It was then, it is now, and I've had enough. I won't do that anymore. I'll read the newspaper or something else. Uh, the other thing you can do if you're in the car is you can listen to music, which I like because that was my undergraduate training was in music, music history. And I like listening to the classic composers. I'm quite a snob. Beethoven, Chopin, the Beatles, the Bee Gees. These are the wonderful composers. But you know what they did? They took all the good music and they transferred it over to certain, to certain stations. Okay. You had to pay to listen to the good composers. So I stopped doing that. So here's what I did. On the way into the city, I would stop at the Santa Monica Library. And my daughter was working there, so I get to see her. And uh, I looked at the audiobooks, books on tape, books on CD. I decided I'll listen to good stories in the car. My idea was I would listen to stories in other languages, which would help my language acquisition. 
okay? And I would listen to classics. I couldn't do either. I wound up listening to bestsellers because that's all they had. The first one I took out, fortunately, was Harry Potter. Harry Potter novels were so good that I listened to all seven of them. I got to tell you guys, Harry Potter was written for us, for you and me, because it's all about education. J.K. Rowling was very interested in what was going on in the classes. So you've got the adventures of Ron, Hermione, Harry, going class to class, how they reacted to the teachers. Um, one of, I, when I gave a course uh, a little while after that, I gave lectures on, on Harry Potter and what it was like because the classes were so interesting. One of my students wrote an essay about one of Harry's friends. If you know Harry Potter, uh, it was Hermione was the girl in the class and Hermione was the student who always had her hand up, always raised her hand, studied hard, knew the answer to everything. And this student wrote a brilliant essay. Is Hermione smart? Is that what we want out of our students, okay? So I read lots of Harry Potter. When I was done with Harry Potter, all seven, I started reading other bestsellers. I read science fiction, which is my favorite. I listened to in the car. I listened to detective novels. I listened to legal novels, novels about the legal system, uh, et cetera. And I learned a great deal and they were riveting. They were all in English. They were bestsellers. They weren't classic, but they were quite good. And I was very impressed with the quality of popular literature. I learned about it then. And that's the basis of the application. To me, language teaching, a good thing to do is to use literature. That liter the synonyms for literature, stories, fiction. I'll tell you about the program I used, or I knew, know the best. It was developed by a colleague of mine, Benico Mason, teaching English as a foreign language in Japan. The first, when students would come in knowing no English beginning, she told them stories. She would study the stories, Grimm's fairy tales, classic stories known to be good, known to be compelling, and she would make sure it was comprehensible, speaking slowly, drawing a lot of pictures to illustrate it, synonyms, occasional translation. That worked. The students liked them. They were compelling and interesting. Get this, the entire class was listening to stories. You go to school, imagine this, your first class in the morning is story time. That's it, you can listen to these wonderful stories told by a master storyteller. And when the story was done, you didn't do testing on the vocabulary. You didn't write definitions. You listened to another story. So over one or two semesters, the students heard hundreds of stories that they liked and understood. We did an experiment. We combined ones uh, listening to stories and doing actually vocabulary exercises with vocabulary from the stories didn't help you're better off listening to stories. You get more vocabulary per time spent by listening to stories than by doing the drills, exercises, um, et cetera. So stories became the cornerstone of our beginning language teaching method. The second, uh, second part of it, uh, Dr. Mason calls it guided self-selected reading, reading of graded readers. That's where I got the idea. I got the idea of reading graded readers in Spanish uh, from Benico's work. And oh my goodness, does it work? My Spanish got so good so quickly. And 99% of my Spanish comes from reading those graded readers. Hey, como te verso, you puedo hablar español. It's amazing how quickly it came and how much fun it was because the books are so good. And I still do that. Well, what Benico did in the first class of uh, guided self selected reading. The first class students would come into the room. There was a big table in the middle. And on the table was a collection of several hundred graded readers in English, the Longman series, the Newberry series. You're familiar with these. And the students would go around the table, looking at these books, seeing if they liked them. They knew some English because they had had, you know, two semesters already of listening to stories. And with the help of the teacher, they selected the first book they wanted to read. 
If they didn't like it, they didn't have to finish. They could put it down and try another one. They weren't tested on anything. It was all pleasure reading. They would do this for a year, year and a half, three semesters. We did one experiment on this. And I'll give you the, this is the best part of the talk, I think. Uh, one experiment, we did it with uh, the Benico students. We gave them alternate versions of the TOEIC. The TOEIC, as some of you know, is the most well-known examination in English. We gave them the listening comprehension and reading portions. The TOEIC goes from zero to a hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, zero to a thousand. If you reach 250, you're ready to start reading. And that's about where these students were after a semester, a little bit more of reading for pleasure. Here's what we found. I find this to be spectacular. For each hour they read, each class period of reading what they wanted to, they gained one half, actually six tenths of a point on the TOEIC. Amazing. Do the math. If you do this every day for a couple of years or a year or a semester, you go from 250 all the way up to 500, 600, sometimes 700, near the top of the scale on the TOEIC examination. So we have very good data there that this really, really does work. I want to tell you about another story, which is my, another study, which is my favorite. By the way, if you want to see all the research on this, it's there for you to see for free. I wrote a book in, what was it, 2004, called The Power of Reading. There's a lot of research in it. There's a lot of fun doing it. And I have put it on the internet. If you go to sdcrashin.com, you can download The Power of Reading and lots of other articles for free. I give it away, not because I'm a nice guy. I give it away because the books are too expensive. Nobody can afford them. I can't afford to buy the books. Uh, if I want to buy a good you know, book of research, it's going to cost me $40, $50, and I need more than one, so I run out of money very, very quickly. So I have done this. Uh, other people, Benico Mason has done this. Jeff McQuillan has done this. Nishan Ashtari has done this. We've made our work available on the internet for anybody. And I think the profession has to do this. Otherwise, no progress. Right now, the only people who can get look at the serious literature, <coughs> the journals and the books are college professors who have privileges in their library. But everybody else can't. So this shouldn't be true. Anyway, I'll tell you about this, uh, my favorite study since the power of reading. We call it Sophie's Choice because the hero is a high school student uh, named Sophia. This study was done by Fei Shen, a former student of mine and uh, her colleagues. Uh, Sophia <coughs> was at a school, excuse me, cheers, we say in Hebrew, Mekhaim. Um She worked at, she uh, taught English at a school that gave the international students a test of English in the fall and a test of English in the spring. So in the fall, you got this, in the spring, you got that to see how much you've gained. When Sophia took the test in the fall, she got a score, but then in the spring, she got worse. She got worse over the year. Oh my. Then she would go home for summer, come back in the fall. Her test in the fall was higher than it was the previous year. She got worse during the year, got better during the fall and made up for her loss and then some. What was she doing over the summer? Now, all this took place in Los Angeles and Los Angeles can get pretty hot in the summer. So what Sophia did, she found a cool spot in the public library and she found the section that had books for young people. Nancy Drew, Sweet Valley High. A lot of good reading in my opinion, very, very good. She read about 50 books over the summer. She would read for you know an hour or two every day, not because she wanted to improve her English, but because she was having a good time. It's a nice place to sit and relax and get out of the heat. That was the, that's the kind of evidence we have. Free reading, self-selected reading gives you what you need. Study after study, I'll summarize the research quickly. People who read for 
pleasure. People who read novels, comic books, magazines, do better in everything tested in language. Their vocabulary is better. Their spelling is better. Uh, their grammar is better. Their writing is better. Their comprehension is better. I got really annoyed today. I got to share it with you. You have to be my therapy group, okay? Uh, Taiwan, neighbors in Taiwan. Oh my, a couple of years ago, they got this idea that Taiwan should become a bilingual country. That it isn't enough just to know Mandarin. You have to know English really, really well. And they want people to take classes in English, et cetera. And they put out a plan, which I just put on the web, uh, web today, uh, that they're gonna have things translated into English, courses will be taught in English, all these things are gonna do in English from now on. Guess what they don't do? They don't do pleasure reading in English. To me, that's all you need to do. Make sure the libraries are filled with good books. I don't think they're gonna do very well in this. So what we found, let me continue, that if you read lots and lots of interesting, fun books for fiction, fiction turns out to be very powerful here, for pleasure, your vocabulary, your grammar, your writing style, everything else will grow if you select the books yourself. We'll come back to that, okay? In fact, my favorite research uh, from all of this, uh, Jeff McQuillan's book, uh, found out that you not only get everyday res uh, reading books, reading, uh, reading language, you get academic language. You get the language that you need for school from reading fiction. People are worried. You read just fiction as just storybooks. No, you get lots of academic books. Jeff's study, he found, if you take a pile of everyday pleasure reading and you look how many words are in the approved lists of academic uh, vocabulary, lots of them. His conclusion, in one year, reading 30 minutes a day, you'll acquire 37% of the core academic vocabulary you need for school. Not bad, pleasure reading. Um, Another study came out, I found this out from McQuillan, another former student of mine. Uh, he found a study by Rolls and Rogers who found if you read a million words of science fiction, you will, you will encounter 92% of the 300 science words that appear in science. This explains something to me because uh, I basically read technical stuff. I read the stuff in language acquisition, et cetera but not much else. Occasionally I'll read an article on nutrition, not very much, but I read a lot of fiction. Of course, I have no trouble reading technical material at all, okay? Because of the science fiction, no matter what field it's in, um, et cetera. Okay, I've given you the big stuff. Now it's gonna get bigger. I think this was good. Wait till you hear the rest. Not only does pleasure reading, things you do for relaxation, give you more language, People who read more know more. They know more about absolutely everything. These are people who read mostly fiction, okay? This gets better and better. If you read lots of fiction, what do you get? You know more about science. You know more about social studies, current events, finance, health, technology, all this stuff. I found this out a few years ago by accident if you're a voter in California, you have to serve on jury duty every couple of years if they call you up. So I was called and I served on a jury. And because at the time I was a college professor, I was elected the foreman of the jury. Boy, that was a bad decision because I know nothing about law. And I don't think I did a good job. In fact, I know I didn't. Uh, the guy who was on trial was, I think was guilty, guilty, guilty. We should have found him guilty. Nine out of 10 of us found him guilty. One person on the jury felt sorry for him. I didn't, I wanted him to go to jail because the judge told us, if you find him guilty, we're not just gonna throw him in jail. We're gonna get treatment for him. We're gonna get therapy. We're gonna find out why he did these things, um, et cetera. It's a case of child abuse. Why kind of a very ugly case. So she wouldn't budge. She said, no, no. After that, they, they had to get another jury, et cetera, big waste of time. Years after that, one of the novels I listened to in the car was by John Grisham, who writes terrific law novels. I don't care about law, but I really like John Grisham. He wrote a book called The Runaway Jury. After reading that book, I knew all about juries. If I had read that book 
before serving on the jury, justice would have been served. We would have saved the government a lot of time, a lot of money, and the guilty person would have gotten the help that he needed. That's why, that's why I really found out how important fiction was. The best, the uh, a study was done a couple of years ago by two people, Stanovich and Cunningham. It was with English as a first language, but it, this is a marvelous study. They took <clears throat> young people who were in college and they, their first two years, and gave them a variety of tests of different areas, of science, history, et cetera. They also found out what their interests were. Uh, did you like reading? Did you like reading books, magazines, bestsellers? Uh, did you like other things? Uh, and a whole list of possible things you might want to do. Did you like mechanics, sports, all this thing? The best predictor of knowledge was like it was recognizing authors who they were. People who read more best selling authors, people who read magazines, people who went to good movies too, they were the ones who knew more about science, history, all the technology, all these things. They knew more than people who got good grades in school. Grades was not a good predictor of how much you knew. The study, reading fiction is better for you than studying hard in school. That's what they found. Okay, so number one, fiction gives you language. It gives you everyday language and it gives you academic language and it gives you knowledge. It gives you something else. People who read fiction know more about other people. Chomsky said this, it is quite possible, overwhelmingly probable we will always learn more about human life and personality from novels than scientific psychology. Uh, American radio personality, Terry Gross, she's the hostess of a show named Fresh Air, really said it perfectly. When you're learning to read fiction, when you have a good teacher, what you're learning in part is empathy. You're learning to be somebody else. You're learning to see the world through their eyes. I think that is absolutely it. This has happened to me. When you read fiction, you become the characters in the novel. You see the world through their eyes. I think it's wonderful. I have a couple of more things to go, then we'll do questions. Um, if this is true, two things become very important. Number one, access to books. If you live in poverty, you don't have much access to books. And this is true in every culture. The only solution is the library. We know from research on libraries, one of my favorite researchers is in this area. It's absolutely wonderful. Libraries are the answer. This is where you can get the reading you need, okay? The best research was done by a guy named Keith Curry Lance. He has his own website, tons of stuff on libraries. I think he's amazing. He found that if a student goes to a public school with a good library with lots and lots of books. And there's a certified public librarian to select the books and help students find the right books for them. The students in those schools have higher reading scores. The library is everything. That's where you can find books and it's good for everyone except for the rich who have lots of them at home, but not very many people do. The other thing that's important is you have to select the books yourself. Self-selection is what counts. Donalyn Miller, good scholar in this area, no single practice inspires my students to read as much as the opportunity to choose their own books do, does. I'll give you two informal pieces of research. There is formal research. Self-selected does better than assigned, but I wanna give you this informal because I think it's more interesting. What happens when someone gives you a book as a gift, do you read it? No, <laughs> usually not. Uh, and then the person who's here, here's this book, Steve, you're gonna love it. And then you see him a week later, he says, didn't you like that book? And you say, well, gosh, you know, I, didn't really, you know, I haven't gotten there yet. I'll get to it, which I won't, okay. Uh, one author says, I get all these gift books and they're on my shelf. I never read a single one and they're sitting down 
looking down at me, making me feel guilty. That's what happens to me too. In each of us though, we have a person in our lives who we do believe and we do read it. I have one person in my life, when he recommends a book, I drop everything and I read it immediately. And that's my son. When he says a book, he always gets it right because he knows me better than I know myself. Uh, another piece of informal evidence, when I was in secondary school, which was in the Midwest in the United States, we had required English classes. We did a year of American literature. We did a year of British literature. I read every single assigned book. I wrote the assigned essays. I did everything right. I passed the courses. I don't remember a single book I read in any of the those literature classes, not one. It's like they never existed. But I did read books that I selected. I read two different genres. Number one, I read science fiction. I read Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein. Uh, these were the big authors then. I learned so much from them. It was amazing. They gave me my values, everything. I learned even more. You'd be surprised from baseball stories. I found an author when I was like 12 named John R. Tunis, who wrote seven novels about a baseball team that he made up, the Brooklyn Dodgers. The author's name was John R. Tunis. And if you know a little bit of baseball, you can follow this, all right? The first book was The Kid from Tompkinsville. I'll give you the story because it's quite important. The Tim, kid from Tom Skill, Tompkinsville was discovered when he was a secondary school student and he was such a good baseball player. He was remarkable. He was the one who threw the ball. He was the pitcher so the batter could try to hit it. He was so good, nobody could beat him. He, he just won every single game. They brought him to the major leagues, to the big time. He won his first 17 games. He was unbelievable. Nobody could touch him. Then tragedy. He was in the shower, he slipped and hurt his elbow. He could still throw, but he couldn't do the fancy pitches that you need to win baseball games. Two years later, he joined the Dodgers again as an outfielder. He was a very good hitter and fielder. Three years later, he was the best batter in the league. He was fantastic. In other words, he found solutions. I saw the book, I read a review of the kid from Tompkinsville in a literary magazine and it said, the kid from Tompkinsville is the boy's book of Job. It's about tragedy, suffering, growing from it and finding a way out of it. I'll tell you about another baseball book that I read from the same author that has the same experience. Again, it's the Brooklyn Dodgers and it's about the shortstop of the Dodgers, one of the players. He's the one who feels the ground ball and throws it the first space. When the book was, uh, and the story was written, he was like 26. He was so good that the owners made him the new manager of the team, which is never unprecedented. You want an older person, not a player. You want an older person in their 40s who's been around, who can work. He was appointed when he was 26 and he was still playing on the team. So he had to establish his authority. The first day he gave a sermon to his, to, his, to his fellow players, uh, a lecture. He, he said a lot of good, the lecture is so good, I made a copy of it and I read it every so often, it's so inspiring. That has influenced me to this day. He said, when you hit the ball and you're running to first base, you have to get to first base before the ball does. The ball, the, the infielder will catch the ball, throw it to first, you've got to be there before the ball does. And if you're in the major leagues, you're not gonna make it because they're so good, they always get you out. I'd say 99 times out of 100, you're not gonna make it. Spike Russell, the new manager said, I don't care, run as fast as you can. Run like hell, run like your life depended on it. What if the fielder dropped the ball? What if the throw was bad? What if the first baseman wasn't paying attention and the ball went right by him? You might lose the game because of that. You, you miss getting to first, maybe even to second base. 
the word I learned from that was be impeccable in what you do. Impeccable means flawless, never making a mistake. I talked about this to my family doctor. I found out that he loved John Artunis. We had great conversations. He read it and he said, that's exactly right. That's how you do medicine. Medicine, you have an ordinary case. It looks simple. Treat it like it's a serious disease. Make sure you get the right medication. Make sure the patient knows how to take it. Make sure there are no side effects. He said, be impeccable. The doctor told me 999 times it won't matter. But that one time out of a thousand, you can save a life. I have thought of that idea well, every day since reading that book. When I do the dishes, I make sure I do a good job. I make sure they're clean. I make sure they're put away in order. When I'm cleaning out outside, I make sure I put things away, put things in the garbage, be impeccable. When my wife says, do this, call this person, I call them. I make sure because otherwise there could be disappointed, etc. This is what you get from good fiction. So to re let me summarize what I've done. Pleasure reading is it. Pleasure reading that you select yourself. You need a good library to do it with good librarians who will help you find the right books. It will improve your life and the life of people you interact with. And it'll improve your language, your literacy, and knowledge of the world. What a deal, okay? Well, it's time for question and answer, but while you're thinking of a question, I'm gonna ask and answer the first question, okay? Because it's the one that usually comes up. I've been talking to you about comprehensible input, how wonderful it is, and reading especially, okay? Wonderful source of comprehensible input. Well, uh, Dr. Krashen, you haven't done very well. I would ask the question that way. You've been working on this theory for 50 years, okay? Who's doing it? Not very many people. I got an advertisement from the local community college. I won't mention their name, Santa Monica Community College. Uh, and I looked at the foreign language courses. They claimed to be doing natural approach, which I was kind of the co-inventor of. They weren't there, then grammar, 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 error correction, all the courses. I wrote them. <laughs> I said, you say you're doing a natural approach, but you're not. And the woman basically said, go to hell. Okay, we're busy here. We got stuff to do. You don't like it. That's too bad. They changed it. They took out natural approach. They're just doing it wrong now. Most places I go to, most uh, institutes, they're doing old fashioned language teaching that could have been done in 1931. So this stuff really hasn't taken hold. There's a good reason why not. I'll tell you what the reasons are. First of all, it's hard to find out. It's hard to find out. How are you gonna find out about Krashen's theory, about comprehensible input, all this? Usually the only way is to read about it. Where do you read about it? Only in books and journals. I've already told you what the problem is. It is frighteningly expensive. That's why I put my books up for free. That's the problem. What I do, I'll tell you what I'm doing about it, which is kind of a struggle. I'm trying to publish my articles in what are called open access journals. Journals that are free to read, journals that are free to subscribe to, uh, et cetera. This is the future. My feeling is that if you're doing something that has a benefit to the public, like I think what I'm doing does, make it free. Make sure people read it. Make sure it's not just for the rich, okay? So this is one reason people don't know about it. Not only are the books expensive, they're written by crazy people. I can't understand most of the articles. I can't even understand the articles that say I'm right, okay? Uh, <laughs> they're written by maniacs. Here's what I've been doing. I go to a lecture and people come out of the lecture and they say, oh, that was wonderful. And I didn't understand it. So what I often do is I ask someone, oh, by the way, what did he talk about? What was that about? They can't tell you. This became obvious to me years ago. I owe this to a former professor of mine, Peter Ladefogad, at when I was a student at UCLA. Peter was an expert in phonetics. 
and he would take us with him to conferences on phonetics. We got in for free and listened to him lecture. One lecture he gave, lectures were mostly incomprehensible because I'm not a specialist in phonetics and I really don't care much about phonetics, okay? But I went to one of Peter's lectures and he started out by saying, you know, um, I'm going to, I, I'm told I have the 20 minutes, but now we've changed it and we only have 15 minutes. So I'm gonna make this short. Peter threw away his notes and gave a clear lecture. He simply said, here's what we did, here's the results, here's what we think it meant. It was comprehensible. It's the only time I understood phonetics when Peter made it very, very simple. He got more criticism than anyone else at the conference because people understood him. And that's one of the reasons why university lectures and technical lectures are so bad because they don't want you to understand. They don't want to be criticized. They just want you to think they're very, very smart because they use all this powerful language, et cetera. So the academic world, in my opinion, has serious, serious problems. That's why the work hasn't gotten around and I'm trying to help by making things free. And I, I subscribe to journals that are free or very low cost. Uh, that's one way around it. Okay, good question. Glad you asked. Any others? Uh, by the way, thank you so much, Dr. Krashen, once again for your fantastic. Okay, I won't say it's a lecture, but it's a way of you expressing your thoughts about our theme for this webinar. Uh, as of now, doctor, we have one question here, okay, uh, from Ms. Cynthia. I believe this would be Cynthia Martinez. How can we plan a lesson based only in language acquisition? Well, I'm, I'm blocking out. You have to say it again. So I had oh, yes, yes, doctor. Sorry. Um, the question here is, how can we plan a lesson based only in language acquisition? You can't. You have to have content. That's why I like stories. <laughs> I think stories is a very easy way of doing this. Yes, you can teach content and it's comprehensible input, but I would start with stories to build up background knowledge and make sure students are in a class that they want to be in. They have to be in this, they have to be on their path and that's hard to do. I hope I've answered the questions. This content has to be fascinating and comprehensible or it won't work. I certainly believe with that doctor and uh, attending most of your sessions with us online, I got that kind of you know, style that you're doing, adding up stories whenever we start our lessons because it helps build up. How are we going to execute the whole lesson itself? Thank you, doctor. We have another question in here, Dr. Krashen. Um, what would be our role as a teacher if we are so lucky to have a library with wide collection of books for our students to choose? So what, what role does teachers have if there are already books that were written in the highest level, doctor? Your goal as a teacher is to help them find the right books for them. And I have a suggestion. I read an article years ago in the school library journals, two pages long, called The Star Method. I have two suggestions. This is one of them. The Star Method, <clears throat> if you're in the library, let's say you're a student, a junior high school student, and you come to a book that you read and you really liked, take your pencil and put a star in the inside front cover. We encourage students to do that. Then if someone is browsing, they come to a book with 10 stars, they'll get curious. They'll want to read it. The star method cost absolutely nothing. I would like people to try it and for them to tell me if it works for them. Second to that, I read another paper also in the School Library Journal called Spider-Man and the Library. They put comic books and graphic novels in the library, but did not allow them to circulate. 
you had to go to the library and read it there. They then let them in, let it stay that way for a couple of months. And they found that library traffic nearly doubled. People came in to read the comic books. And the amount of comic book material and non-comic book material went up dramatically. Books taken out of the library increased dramatically. Uh, I want to stay with comic books for a moment because uh, I want to tell you how important I am, all right? I am the world's number one researcher in the impact of comics on literacy. It's because I'm the only one, okay? No one else has done. We've done some studies of comics and they are really wonderful. It all begins with me. When I was in the third grade, I was in the low reading group. My father brought home comic books. Within two months, I was in the highest group. It was spectacular, okay? Students have to discover them for themselves. Getting comic books there, the comic books are better than they have ever been, by the way. Uh, thanks to Stan Lee and the Marvel Comic Book Company, where you have superheroes with problems, is absolutely riveting. I still love reading comic books. I still think they're wonderful. Okay, question came up, I'll repeat it. Uh, which audio, author or book would you recommend? for junior high and senior high school students, that's up to you. You have to try it yourself. What I would what you want is a recommendation from your pals, from your peers. That's why I like the STAR method so much. I wanna get kids into the library. That's why I like comic books so much. Good, and students can write book reports, book reviews, recommend them to others, but it's impossible for me to make a recommendation for you that's a serious one. I can make a casual one. I read this one and it's pretty good, but I don't know you very well. And your peers at school know you very well. That's why I like the STAR method. They can recommend books for kids their age. Next question. Yes, doctor. Thank you for that answer. Um, doctor, we have here this uh, most common question that is being asked nowadays. How to motivate students to read books if they are into technology already? A good story. A good story is always the way to do it. Uh, technology has its fine, but it has its limits. Uh, it, you know, once, once they get to see the real prints, the real stuff, they'll want more. And you know what? People say kids don't read anymore. Kids don't read anymore. Not true. They're still reading. They're still reading just as much as they always did. I don't know why people spread these rumors, but books are still popular. I'll tell you what I think is um, a little bit good and a little bit bad. What is going on now in, in libraries is the libraries are all becoming digital. There was a big debate on this with uh, Vermont University. They made all their libraries digital. They fired some of the librarians and not good. Uh, reading things, if something is serious reading, if it's technical, you're much better off reading it in print than you are digital. Digital works fine with narrative fiction, and I'm in favor of that, of course, of course, of course. So fine, digital is all right. But at least for some things, we need both. And I'm all in favor of having both in libraries. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I believe, Dr. Krashen, that your response to that answered some of the other questions. And uh, doctor, uh, we'll just give you last or one more. Okay, this is the last actually. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, doctor, the question here from Ms. Looney Blanilla. Uh, Dr. Krashen, when should we start teaching students vocabulary and other things? Do they need to read books for a quarter and making... I cannot read the other word. They have acquired. So uh, basically the question, doctor, is when is the right time that we should allow the students to read? Or when is the right time that they should learn vocabulary? The only real way of learning vocabulary is listening to stories and reading. It's the only thing that counts. No one ever learned much vocabulary from doing a list of 10 words that you have to memorize that week because it's forgotten. 
things that you are forced to do, you just forget right away. It doesn't stick to the memory, memory as we know. <clears throat> so reading is the answer to vocabulary and stories are the answer. And that starts right away. There was a wonderful statistic of a study of parents reading to kids, telling the kids stories. They asked the children, these are children three, four years old, do you like it when mommy and daddy tells you a story? 90% of the children said yes. The 10% who said no, mommy and daddy didn't like telling their kids stories, if you can imagine that. So this starts at the very beginning. Those of you who are parents know all about this. Story is popular with children nearly from the moment they're born. And that is the source of vocabulary, that is the source of language, and the source of most of their knowledge. Thank you, Doctor. And one of our heads from LSPU San Pablo City, Dr. Nympha Domakulangan, uh, just would like to share with you, Doctor. He said, good morning, Professor Krashen. I've been explaining your theory for years now. I hope I'm doing it right. I instruct my students, uh, her students are in the master's degree, Dr. Krashen, to make their classroom a venue for language acquisition and learning and to use comprehensible material. But Dr. Dimakulangan said she would suggest short ones from authentic materials, not long <clears throat> fiction. Right. Uh, is that okay? Is no. that process she made? I think, I think she's absolutely right. And I would trust her opinion over my own because she's a practicing teacher and has seen it happen over and over again. All right, wonderful. And uh, last feedback for your uh, wonderful session, Dr. Krashen. First of all, it's a privilege to be attending your lecture, Dr. Krashen. I read lots about you when learning English. Um, and she said that there's, yeah, there's a, a question after giving a compliment to you, doctor. This is the last one, doctor. How can we apply the I plus one in a class with the students that are in different linguistic competence level? Any particular way to Good. associate linguistics? Okay, I'm glad that came up. I should have talked about it. Fascinating hypothesis. If you give people lots of comprehensible input, the structure they need is there in the input. It's what we call I plus one. If the input is comprehensible, it contains the next structure that they're ready to acquire. It's automatic, it's mystical and wonderful. You don't have to worry about it as long as the students are reading interesting books and hearing interesting stories and going to interesting movies too. It's all there all the time. You don't have to program it. You don't have to worry about that. I call this, by the way, the Pasadena Freeway Hypothesis. It hit, that hit me years ago when I was driving the car on the freeway. And I had the same question that was just brought up. I got, I got the idea of driving. I got off the freeway, parked the car, and wrote it down. Because you can forget it right away. You got to write it down right away. And since then, I'm sure that's the answer. I'm as sure of that as anything. Lots of reading, lots of stories, and the structures you need are there for you. It's like the balanced diet. You shouldn't go out and say, gee, I need some vitamin B, B10 today or vitamin B12. I'm low on calcium. I'll do that. No, have a balanced diet with a variety of well-cooked and fresh foods and you'll get all the vitamins you need. The same idea. Same thing with reading. Enjoy yourself. Wonderful, Dr. Krashen. And like I've said, that's the last question because, you know, uh, we know it's already, uh, I believe it's already past eight in Los Angeles right now, doctor. Am I right? <laughs> I have one more thing to say, though. I have one more request. Yes, doctor. Um, we can be in touch. If you follow me on Facebook, I'm on Facebook. I post nearly every day some comment. I was on Twitter for a while, but they kicked me off. And I'm not sure why I did something wrong. Okay. So I got onto Facebook and you can, that's I'm every day. I have some comments, something or other, and I'll welcome your comments as well on Facebook. Lovely. That's good news because most of the users nowadays, they tend to, you know, check Facebook from time to time and 
that is a good news for each and everyone. Even us educators, Doctor, we could you know check yeah. out your daily posts. And uh, Doctor Krashen, before we let you go of this virtual session, we would like to request a photo opportunity with you. So may I request everyone to kindly open your camera. Okay, so you could uh, take a picture with uh, the great Dr. Krashen, as what we usually call him. <laughs> All right, so uh, we don't know in which page you are, but we have eight pages right now. This is, I believe, one of the biggest sessions we had as well. So um, I will take the first panel. So three, two, one, kindly stay with your smile, please. All right, for a while, guys. There you go. I'll just save. <laughs> okay. Oops, sorry. Just for a while. You could also take your uh, own picture if you want to. All right. Let's go with the second panel. All right. For the second panel, in three, two, one. Kindly smile, please. There you go. All right. Let's go with the third panel. Bear with me. All right. Third panel in three, two, one. All right. There you go. Thank you. Let me go with the fourth panel, okay? Dr. Krashen, please bear with us since there are lots of participants. <laughs> All right, fourth panel, please. If you still have your cameras open in three, two, one, smile for the camera. There you go. Fifth panel, almost down to two. All right, in three, two, one. Perfect. Okay, and the last panel. Seven, three, two, one. Wonderful. Once again, the great Dr. Krashen. Let's give him a warm of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Krashen, for always gracing yeah, in the webinar series of Filipino educators. We hope we could see you in a face-to-face -face seminar, okay? We know it might take quite a while, but if ever you're gonna be visiting us, it would be no, an I'm, honor. I'm, I'm okay. not traveling anymore. I'm not traveling. <laughs> I'm staying home. I know, I'll we know, you, Doctor. Let me make a comment on staying home. Yes, Doctor. You might be interested in this. One more comment. When um, oh, uh, the world's greatest physicist, what's his name, the first physicist. Oh, I'm having, this happens in old age. Who? Who is the first physics genius in the world? Well, this guy stayed home for a year because of the plague, okay? When he stayed home for a year, I, I mean, this is horrible. This will happen to you in 30 years, okay? Um, he stayed home for a year because of the plague. He didn't want to get sick. And he was a mediocre graduate student at Cambridge. While he was home, Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, when Isaac Newton was home for a year, he invented calculus, home by himself. I've had a pretty good time being home by myself, getting a lot of work done. So solitude is wonderful. I'm, I tell people, I tell people I'm home alone with my girlfriend. And I've only been married, we've only been married for 55 years. So it's still pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really wonderful, Doctor. Once again, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you. Your wonderful stories inspired us. And in this challenging moments, we will always follow your simple life lessons, especially when it comes to using the English grammar. So once again, Doctor, from all the participants in here, from the academic officials to all the graduate students, thank you so much. And we hope to hear from you again, Doctor. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Facebook. Good. <laughs> yes, Doctor. Thank you so much, Doctor. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You too. Earth a wonderful day. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, to the...
uh, to the student heads of, or if I'm not mistaken, the head of the student org who's sharing po nung ating attendance for Dr. Glenn. I'll just stop the recording po.